All right, I think um, we're ready to start. Just uh, before I start, I just wonder who's, uh, who's going to try to beat me and uh, finish the workshop before I am finished. Okay, there's at least one. Okay, who is doing the workshop together with me? Okay, that's quite a few more, that's great. So, Combine um, was introduced this year. Um, it's fresh, it's quite new. I think uh, I just got a message from uh, someone from the audience that yesterday Xcode, the new release, added quite some new features for Combine as well, which I could definitely use in this workshop, but I don't have it yet. Um, I'll explain you a few of those. Who had any experience with Combine so far? All right, quite a few. Who has experience with Rx Swift? <laughs> okay, that's a lot more. And then the competitor, Reactive Swift, Reactive Coco. Okay. Okay, so there's quite a lot of people, at least with experience of reactive programming. That's great. So first, for the ones who didn't download the workshop, um, this is the GitHub page. It's uh, publicly available. You can go here uh, maybe after uh, MobileConf finished. It um, includes two folders. One uh, folder with the exercises, which is basically a basic setup where you can get started and try to implement the workshop. And if you're stuck at any time, just visit the solutions folder, download the project in there, open it, and you'll find all the, uh, the answers of the exercises. It's basically four steps. I can uh, show you, this is the uh, solution application. Um, the idea behind the application is that it contains a few controllers which you will probably implement in a real app as well. So the first one is, for example, if you have a terms and conditions page, you need a switch, you turn it on, and the button is automatically enabled. This is also the first step you finished later on, and you get to level two, where we have three switches, which are all combined together. And whenever one of the switches is not set to true, the button will be disabled. Then there is a, a classic form. Form validation is a lot easier with combine. Um, I'll show you later on with the, with the code. Um, maybe I can make the simulator a bit bigger as well. As far as my screen allows me to make it bigger. So this form contains a few validations which aren't visible here yet, but I'll show you later in the explanation of the steps. So say I fill in my name. You see it's already turning red. Then I do a very strong password which is even green. Um, so what it does, it checks already registered usernames. Um, and as we are at MobiConf, I filled in all the presenters uh, of MobiConf, so those names are taken. Sorry for any speakers which are on the audience. So now it's all green. Um, if you use a weak password, it's on one hand not the same as the second password, so it fails, but it's also a weak password. Because if I change this to the same, it's still not getting green. So let's finish this step for now and go to step four. Step four is um, a few controller in which you will do a networking request. It's probably something you will implement in a real app as well. And this one is searching for Swift repositories on GitHub. So if I fill in combine workshop, there it is. And it contains all kinds of small things, which are like a one-liner in Combine. But if you would do it in plain UI Git, it's pretty hard, or a lot harder than it is now. For example, if I take away the last two letters, it doesn't reload the result, because actually, when the input stopped, the final result is the same as the result we had before, so it doesn't have to refresh the list. So that's actually two operators. Um, 
I'll show you later in the code how it actually works. But this is the end result we're trying to build in the coming two hours. Um, there's some break in between in about 40 minutes, so I'll give you time to just get a coffee, get some energy to finish off the workshop later on with me. If you want to do this on your own, um, the form validation with colors is optional. There's a spinner in the last page that's optional. Basically, just try to enable the button with the basics and then continue to step four. There's also a few valuable references. There's a um, combined playground. You might have seen it already. I'll uh, use that as an introduction to combine. And there's also uh, my blog post, which covers basically all the things I'm discussing here as well. Um, all the steps, like what is combine, the basic principles, but also error handling and debugging. Um, all kinds of tips, which will definitely help you to get through the workshop. Um, but the playground, that's the best way to find your answers to all the steps in, in the workshop. Right, let's see. This is readable for all of you, right? Someone in the back, can you say yes if it's readable? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> all right, so we just saw that there's quite some knowledge about uh, the way of programming with a framework like Combine. Um, Apple basically has a definition as well, like why would you use Combine? Um, in my perception, it's, it's at least a lot easier to do asynchronous programming. Um, there's a lot less closures. You can respond to asynchronous events and easily bind it to UI labels, UI kit objects. Um, there is a downside to combine. Let's get started with that, and I will not go back to that in the whole workshop, but uh, there's a big learning curve. So if you decide to use this and you know how to use combine, but later on a colleague joins and he has no idea how it all works, then it can probably take quite uh, some time to get up to speed with the project and know how it all works. Same thing, debugging is quite hard. It's, it's pretty hard to find the backtrace and find back like where did it go wrong. Um, Combine comes with a few nice operators that make it easier, but prepare yourself that sometimes it's pretty hard to, to find a solution for a bug. But today I will say Combine is great and you should all use it. So let's keep that in mind and walk you through the playground. So first, um, a basic principle, publishers, operators, and subscribers. A publisher is something what publishes a value. The operators will change it over the stream, and then the subscriber will receive the value. So it could be that you have a publisher for a new blog post, the operator will filter out only the title, and then the subscriber will show the title in a list. In this example, I have a publisher with uh, just a number of 28, and we map it to a string, and finally we will print out the value. It's a very basic pr um, example of an publisher with an operator, which is the map, and finally the subscriber, which is the sync, and we print out the value. So step two, um, it's already getting a bit more complicated here, but it basically shows you where you can receive all kinds of events. So whenever there's happening a new subscription, when you find a new value, when the Subscribe subscription is cancelled or completed. Um, and these events are very valuable if you want to show a spinner when a subscription starts and hide the spinner when it's finished. There's also a replace error. Um, if you won't do that, you will get those kind of nice errors which are saying that the error type is mismatching. Publishers, and that's the difference to Rx Swift. Uh, have typed errors, so the errors need to match before you can continue in your whole stream of operators. So that's why I replaced the error here with the string value, 
because the sync expects to be receiving a never error tag. Then there is uh, the rule of a subscription. Whenever your subscription breaks for an error or it completes, the subscription is, is, is gone. So in this example, we do a hello, hello again, and there a hello for the last time. But then I do a completion with a failure, and then the last hello will not be passed through because the subscription is already gone. So we can run this, and you'll see that the last hello is not triggered. If we would remove this line, obviously, we receive the hello. And then in the end, because the subscription is released, it will get canceled as well. So this is the part um, which has changed in the new Xcode. And it's also the part where Combine really shines, I think, because it makes Coding with UIKit a lot easier, but as well with uh, foundation APIs. One example is uh, doing a data request. Uh, URL session comes with a data task publisher for a URL. You can map it to pass through only the data. And finally, with an easy one-liner, you can decode it to the JSON object, and that will end up in the JSON you need for your code. You can also respond to any notifications. So a common example is whenever your application enters the foreground, you want to reload your data. So you call, for example, reload data on your table view. And there is binding. And this makes it really easy to keep your UI labels up to date. Say you have an MVVM system in your, in your app, and you want to bind a value whenever it changes to a UI label. Uh, a common solution now would be to write a delegate and say, like, update data, for example. And with this, you can just assign a publisher value to your label, and it removes a lot of clutter. I think uh, RX Swift has, a, I think, a custom operator. It's been a while, but I think it was something like this, in which you could do the same, uh, which assigns uh, with RX Coco a value to a publisher. This is a, a new property wrapper added to work with Combine. What it basically does, it transforms your property into a publisher. This page uh, doesn't work in the playground, so uh, note that if you want to run this. But this is like an example of a MVVM implementation where we have a property which says whether submission is allowed or not. We basically say we want to receive it on the main queue, as we are going to assign it to a UI kit label. You can do a print in between, just for debugging purposes or when you want to know what's happening. And finally, we assign it to the is enabled property of the submit button. Um, this is probably also the code you need later on in uh, one of the steps. Then there is memory management. Um, you need to handle the subscriptions. If you don't save the subscription, your subscription will directly be released, and you will never receive any failures. And on the other hand, uh, you can also run into retain cycles. And it's quite easy to, to handle this, actually. What you do is you define a property on your instance, in this example, we have a foreground subscriber of the type any cancelable. And what any cancelable does, it basically contains uh, a simple method in the D in it, which triggers the cancel method on your subscription. Then you create a publisher, which in this case listens to the will enter foreground notification and does the reload data, which we described before. And you Connect it finally to your any cancelable foreground subscriber. So I briefly 
discussed before that the error types need to match. In this example, we flat map into a different publisher, the URL session publisher, but the data task publisher is returning a URL error instead of a custom request error. So what you can do to match the error types when you flat map back in your original stream, basically you create a new case which takes uh, any error type and you can map it back to the requ required error type for your publisher. If we will run this, we'll see that we get a nice image. And to get a sense of what it will look like, if you wouldn't do the map error, you'll get an error that the error types are not matching. In this case, the URL error is not the same as the request error, which we defined in our publisher. So basically, we say here, I expect the URL to be passed through as a value. And I expect if there is an error, that it will be the error type request error. Then there is combined latest. Um, if you've worked with Reactive Swift or with Rx Swift, this should be quite common. What it basically does, you have multiple publishers sending out multiple values, and you want to combine them and respond to any changes of them. And it's, meant it's named combined latest because it takes the last value which was passed through. So in this example, we have a username publisher and a password publisher. There is a bit of validation happening. And you will see, after we run this one, you will not see any output because we only sent through a vendorly, but we didn't yet send through a password, so we don't have a last value from the other publisher, and we need at least one value from both publishers before it's passed through. But as this is a weak password, it will not pass through our validation of at least 12 characters. So only at the end, we will get a print that the credentials are valid or not. So what you can see, first, a vendorly is going through, but as we don't have uh, a second value, it stops. Then we get a weak pass. It's being mapped to a false because it's not valid. We have a weak password. And in the end, we pass through the strong password, which is valid, so we get a true response. So then there's uh, future promises. It could be that, for example, with validating the username, you need to do a network request to ask your backend, hey, is this username still available or is it already registered or not? But you still want to continue in that stream afterwards. So for that, you can use the future and promises. And in this example, I created my own fake, more or less, network request to fetch the user for an ID. So imagine that instead of here fetching the user from the array, you would do a request to your backend, give me a user for this ID. Then we have a publisher, which takes an integer. In this case, this would be the user identifier. And we flat map it into a feature in which you can do the asynchronous call. Whenever your asynchronous call comes back, you can do the promise with either a success or a failure. And that's the moment your publisher will continue to validate the input. So in this case, we will get the user.name. We catch the error. And in this case, we don't want to do anything with the error other than the mapping the string to not found, telling the UI, like, hey, user is not found for this ID. So first, we send ID 0, which will be Antoine. And ID 5 is not in the error list, so that will be saying user is not found. So 
I think this is actually fixed in the new Xcode, but I'll just briefly walk you through. Um, this is the more advanced part of the playground, which is not really needed in the, uh, in the workshop later on. Um, of course, if you like it, you can always use it and try it out. What I did here is um, I created my own custom publisher to respond to UI control events. The thing is, um, in the workshop, we use a UI switch, which has an is on property, which is not key VL compliant. So when you wanted to create a publisher for a key path, it would never trigger any changes. And therefore, um, you can use this custom publisher, which will listen to the value changed event. And whenever the value changes, it will pass through an a, a value. Um, I might come back to this when we have time left by the end of the workshop. For now, it's a bit too, too advanced. So finally, we have the debugging properties. Um, as you can see, there is a blog post about it as well. If you want to read a bit more in depth about how to do uh, debugging with Combine, if you want to use this for, for, for real in your app, you probably uh, want to make sure how to debug, uh, debug and combine. So in this example, we uh, use a breakpoint, but it's not working, obviously, in, uh, in combine here in the playground. But what you can do is you can say to the, the compiler, whenever something happens, I want to trigger a breakpoint so it stops there. Um, I think I removed the code in here, but what it basically is. So these are the three methods you have. And this is actually the one which is uh, most useful. You can see it has three callbacks, which you can implement. And whenever one of those callbacks is returning true, it will trigger a breakpoint in Xcode. So you can use this heavily for when you're debugging. And you want to check, like, hey, whenever the user ID is 5, it says that there is no user found, although I'm pretty sure there is a user for ID 5. So I want to trigger a breakpoint whenever user fa value 5 is passed through and stop the compiler there. So there is a simple print operator as well. Um, let me remove this code so we can actually run it. And you can see what the print will do. Um, so it starts on the bottom where you can see that we received the subscription, we received the value, and then we request a limited values, which basically says, like, hey, I want to listen as long as the subscription stays alive. I want to receive values. And we receive a cancel. That's when the subscription is released. So these are the basics you need for Combine. Um, this is the moment we will start implementing the code. I think as we have quite some time, I think we still have, including the break, around like an hour or so, maybe even more. So whenever I go too fast or you have a question, uh, just raise your hand and let's try to answer those questions um, directly because it could also help others to understand what I'm doing. Um, it could be that for me it's already quite easy and I run a bit too fast through the code, but I want to make sure it's, uh, it's followable. If it takes too long, the questions we can always do the in, in the end later on. So we have the solutions project, and we have the exercises project. Um, and as you can see, if we, I'm not so sure. I can't zoom in this part on the left, but we have uh, four view controllers: step one, step two, three. And four, the application will uh, remember whether you finished step one. So you don't have to click through each step all the time when you're testing. But yeah, let's get started. You can find uh, the description, like what do you need to do for this step uh, in the top. And in this case, it's the, the very simple implementation of co connecting a UI switch to the button, um, as I just did the solutions. I want to start firstly, so I'm removing the solutions application, and then run it. 
So as you can see, we are at page number one, but our UI switch is doing nothing. And when I started implementing this workshop, um, I think it was three weeks after dubbed up, I thought it makes total sense to ask the button switch for a publisher for the is on property. I want to receive it on the main queue. For the sake of debugging in this case, I will do a print so I know what's happening. And I want to assign it to the next button and the is enabled property. I thought this should work, right? Xcode is helping me. The result of the assigned to is unused. So let's see. And any can cancelable. As we discussed in the playground, we need to save that to make sure it's retained. So we have to switch subscriber and we connect it. And we run the code. And as you can see, in the console, we don't get any values whenever I change. We only get the initial value, but nothing more than that. And that's because it's on, it's not sending out any key uh, value observation events. Um, so this wasn't useful. So for the sake of the workshop, I implemented the IB action, and I basically set uh, the property button switch value to the value of the switch. And we need to rewrite this code to work with that. So first, we change this to a published property, which allows us to observe any changes on this property. So if I remove this code, or maybe yeah, like this. There is one thing you need to know with uh, published uh, properties, because it comes with a dollar sign. You can read out the normal value by just doing button switch value. As you can see, the return type is a Boolean. But if you want to use the publisher, you need to use the dollar sign. And you can see that it's a publisher of a Boolean type. From that point, you can assign it to is enabled on next button. And I did a tricky thing here. I'm changing the value on a background queue. And this is just to uh, demonstrate what will happen if you won't receive on the main thread. As you can see, it will say set enabled must be used from the main queue. Boom, crash. This is not what you want. Um, by the way, um, if you are new to these purple warnings, it's the main thread checker, which you can enable in the, in the schema. Um, and it will help you to give those kind of warnings. And you can also see the warnings here in the top, the purple icon, where it's basically saying the same UI button set enabled must be used from the main thread only. <coughs> so we change this code. We say receive on this bit q.main. We run the code again. And voila, we can go to step two. All right, so who's ahead of me right now? I see one, only one? <laughs> okay, who's, who's still with me? All right, am I going at a good pace? All right because this was the most easiest one. If I'm going too fast now, then let's see. So step two comes with three switches. And whenever they are all turned on, we want to have the button to be enabled. So what we want to do is first make them publish properties. And this is the moment you can also use the multiple cursors. 
which is very handy. Um, you can use that with Control Shift, uh, which gives you the ability to create all those courses. It's really handy in some places. Either way, um, we now have three publishers, and we need to combine it. For that, we have the combine latest. Oh yeah, um, my MacBook has the keyboard problem, so you'll see this more often. So combine latest comes with a, a few options. Um, the first one only takes two publishers. If you want to use three publishers, there's the combine latest tree, and you also have the number four. There is an open source implementation which takes an array of publishers. Um, you'll probably find it if you Google it. Uh, if you need it, you can ask me afterwards as well. Um, that allows you to combine even more publishers. Although you should ask yourself whether you want to have code which combines that many publishers. Either way, for this one, So um, the default combine implementation doesn't come with an option to pass in an array. So there is a custom publisher created by, uh, by Daniel. Um, and that allows you to, to, to work with an array instead of to combine latest, combine latest three, combine latest four. It's just a bit nicer to work that way. And it allows you to, for example, combine five publishers or six. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, why wasn't it included? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it would, would be a lot easier. It could be that it's just uh, a principle. They don't want to create it like that. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I can't give you the right answer, I think. All right, so we have the combined latest. Um, it takes A, B, and C, basically the three publishers. Uh, don't make the mistake to forget the dollar sign. So we start with the dollar sign, switch one failure, switch two failure, and switch three failure. As I did the same uh, tricky thing here, we want to receive it on the main thread, but only at the very end, because right now we uh, have a publisher with three Boolean values. But we want to connect it to the button, which only takes one Boolean value. So first we need an operator. And we use a map in this case. And it's good to point out that you also have a flat map and a com uh, uh, the other one. Help me. What was the other one? Compact map. Compact map. Thank you. Um, with compact map, it would only pass through if you return actually a value. And in some cases, you want to make sure you use the map so you will always get values. In this case, we want to get a value when it's true and when it's false. So we use a map to always get a value at least. And as we have three booleans, oh, this is great. Um, normally, I would use the dollar sign. So we want to have them all to be true. Um, which will result in a uh, single Boolean publisher, which we can use to connect to the button. Assign to. It's enabled on next button. Of course, we need to save it to the uncancelable. And once again, if I wouldn't do this, Xcode is not helping here. Um, this is also working with Combine. Um, it's definitely not always clear what is going on. Um, and this is still pretty simple what we're doing here. Later on with the URL session, you will see that it's even harder. Um, so you need to sometimes make sure to give Xcode uh, more context. Um, in this case, we know we need a single Boolean publisher, so we'll just keep the map here uh, as enabled. So let's run. So this works, and it's good to check that it also works 
and never any other Boolean uh, is changing. So that was uh, step two. So now we had uh, a single publisher with an operator. Uh, we also combined multiple publishers. Um, we made sure we received it on the main queue. And finally, we assign it to the UI button. Is everyone still with me, the ones who follow along? Step three, all right. So now we, um, we get to the harder part. Um, we basically need to manage three text fields. We need the input of all three. We need to make sure the username is not yet registered. We need to make sure the password is not weak, so it's not in the weak passwords list. Um, so these are the weak passwords for today. These are the list of uh, usernames which are already taken. And we need to make sure that the password is the same as the password again. So uh, for the ones who follow along, um, within the code, I give you all the things you need to take care of. And there is one note in the end where it says you need to erase it to an any publisher. And it was not per se needed in this code, but I decided to add it as it's good to think about it. Because what combine does, whenever you map to a different value, you get a publisher wrapped in another publisher wrapped in another publisher, which in the end comes with a very strange long type which is not readable. And it could also give more context about the underlying implementation. So say, for example, you're developing an SDK and you don't want to give too much details about what's going on under the hood. You can always erase to the any publisher and the only thing they will know is that it's a Boolean and a never error in this case. And what happened before that we had a string of a password and so on, they have no clue. Um, it's just a little nicer if you implement those kind of codes in an SDK. So we have the username. We are going to use the registered username array at first. Um, an extra step, if you're ahead during my implementation, is to use this um, asynchronous Siri is uh, responding here. Either way, use this a asynchronous method with a feature and promise and try to make that work, um, but it's a bit more advanced. We don't have any changes on the background this time, but we still want to receive on the main thread later on. So let's see, at first, we have a subscriber with the validated credentials. The validated credentials need to bring the validation of the password and the username together. So let's start with validating the password. First, we need to have a published variable for the username, password, and password again. Um, we are setting this in the did change event uh, we implemented for the UI text field. And for this, we're going to use uh, both the password and the password again. So first we remove the fatal error. Then we say publishers.combine latest, and we only have two, so we can use this one. And then we say password and password again. Once again, uh, we want to make sure the values pass through all the time, so we don't use a compact map here, but we use a map. And what we say, we have a password and a password again. And now we can actually do the validation. So obviously we get an error, and this is what I mean why you would want to use an erase to any publisher. Um, because these are all the wrapped things you would otherwise get. Um, it's not so nice, it only adds clutter, and it doesn't work that nice if you want to work with your FDK later on. So first, we're going to guard the password. Equals password again. Then we see that we need eight characters or more, so we say 
password that count is bigger than seven, so it's eight or more. Just for readability, I'm closing the guard right here, and then on the second line. We want to make sure the password is not in the array of weak passwords. So we guard again. And as we want to have a Boolean value, we can return false. In this case, because it means that the validation went wrong, false. But if it all passes, we can return true that the password is validated. So as we need an any publisher, we're going to erase to any publisher. And this will work. Just a building to see that Xcode is happy. So we're good here. Um, we didn't use the return here. It's not needed anymore. <coughs> but let's use it for readability in this case, because we have multiple lines. And then we want to use the validation, implement the validation for the username. And in this case, we can do almost the same, but now we need to check the registered usernames, and the username should be four characters or more. So once again, we take the username and we map the username. We guard that cell that registered usernames contains username. This is false, but maybe the shorter hand in this case is a bit nicer. Then we say the username dot count is bigger than three as it needs to be four or more. And else we return false as it's not valid. If it is valid and it passes through uh, the validation here, we can return true. Let's remove the fatal error. And let's uh, erase to any publisher. So let's see if Xcode is happy with us. We now um, created basically two new publishers from the publishers from the password and the username. We have one publisher sending out a Boolean value when the passwords are validated. And we have a new publisher which uh, passes through a Boolean of true when the username is valid. And there's one thing we need to implement now is to connect those two new publishers together and have one final publisher which gives us a Boolean which we can use to enable the button. That one is uh, fairly simple now. We did this uh, quite a few times. So we can combine latest. We say the validated username and validated password. Then we map that both uh, outputs are true and then we erase to any publisher. So basically, we uh, created a final publisher which we want to use, which will only return a true Boolean if both the username and password are valid. And we can use this uh, publisher to connect to our next button. So we want to make sure that we receive it on the main thread. Um, in this case, we know that it's coming from the main thread, but if we would implement the asynchronous call to check the usernames, um, you want to make sure that it's always coming back on the main thread. This is just the best practice, to always receive on the main queue uh, if you're working with UIKit. Um, I think the break starts, but I'm, I'm almost finished with this step, so I think that's a great moment to, uh, to start the break. So let's finish and then uh, we can all get a coffee. Uh, I can use a coffee as well. So let's assign it to. 
is enabled on the next button, and we can run the code. So it perfectly remembers that we are at step three. So I fill in Antoine, password, password. The button is not enabled because Antoine is already in the list. We remove the E and it's working. Um, I also want to make sure that the character count is taken into account. So this is too short, it's only two characters and we needed at least four. If the password don't match, it's also working. And if they do match but they are a weak password, it's also not going to true. So we can do like this and we enable the button and we can go to step four. So this is, uh, I think, a way nicer way to implement form validation. And the great thing is, which we will do later, um, is that you can reuse those publishers to, for example, do the colors based on the value coming out of the password validation or the username validation. So let's uh, take a short break of 15 minutes. Uh, I think this just take the planning which is in the app and let's continue uh, in a bit and go for step four. Thank you. If you're uh, new to this part, if you didn't see part one, um, here's the link of the workshop, which contains uh, four steps, and we're about to implement step four. Um, you might want to look at the code at the same time, or maybe uh, implement it and follow along. I think we'll start in three minutes and then... Uh, Right, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Um, we only have till 12, and uh, I want to make sure we have some room for questions in the end. Um, during the break, I um, I got a few questions, and I think it's valuable for you to know uh, the answers as well. One of the uh, questions was about uh, when you move from RX Swift to Combine, and if you want to compare that a bit more in depth. Um, I want to show this uh, this blog post, which is on Medium. If you search on Google Rx Swift versus Combine, you will find it quite easily. Um, but it's like a map for changing from Rx Swift to Combine. So it b basically says if you have an observable in Rx Swift, um, it's a publisher in Combine, and so on. Um, this will also help if you uh, want to find that, that kind of operators which you would use in Rx Swift and find the same one for uh, for using in Combine. There's one thing to know as well that uh, Combine only works from iOS 13 and up, so that could be a reason to not implement it. Uh, I think there is an open framework called Open Combine, which is basically trying to re-implement what Combine is doing, but obviously I'm not so sure whether you should use that. Uh, rather wait for uh, the full adoption of iOS 13 or when you can only build apps with uh, iOS 13 and up. Uh, benefit of Combine is that it's included in the Apple framework, so you are not adding a, an external dependency which needs to be updated uh, and contains an extra dependency, more or less. So, uh, If you're able to use Combine, if you're starting a new app, I would definitely go for Combine. Another question was like, hey, do you think Combine is already stable enough? Is it like not changing a lot anymore? Um, if I look at the first weeks after dubbed up, uh, the code was not really matching with the presentation, uh, which made me think like, hey, they have a vision for Combine, and they're working towards that. In the end, right now, if I compare the code, it's pretty similar to what they had in mind. And over the past betas of Xcode, there weren't that many big changes. So in that sense, I would say Combine is pretty 
pretty stable uh, and something you can start using as of today. Another question I got, and I forgot to cover that during the walkthrough of the playground. How does it work with memory management? So I briefly discussed the any cancelable, which is basically the dispose back of uh, RX Swift, and that enables you to um, release the subscription when your view controller releases as well. You kind of need that because uh, subscriptions retain the operators on them, so they need to be released. But in this case, um, in this example, we have an unknown self. And to demonstrate what, what will happen if you would not add that unknown self. So to guide you through the code, we have the home view controller. We call view that load manually for, for the sake of this playground which will set up the, the publisher and the subscription. Then we post the, hey, I'm entering the foreground, and the foreground event will be handled by the subscription and eventually reload the table view. But as this code right now does not contain the unknown self, it's retaining the table view, which will be released if the view controller is dismissed. So this could end up in a crash. Because right now, if I run this code, Although home view controller is set to nil, we can still see that we have two reloading table views, one for the first post and one for the second post. And if we add back the, oh, sorry, <laughs> unknown self, and we execute the code again, you can see that the, the init is called from the home view controller and the foreground subscriber is canceled. Um, and this is what you want. You don't have any memory issues afterwards, uh, and this is this is great. And you could also ask the question: Why would you use unknown here instead of weak? As you know that the subscription is released at the same time with the view controller, you know that you can use an unknown self, and you don't have to work with any optionals. So yeah, this uh, this is answering a bit more uh, on how to deal with with. Uh, memory management. As well, I think we can check what happens if we remove the unacancelable. Um, you will probably not end up doing this because you get a warning. But I can imagine if you say fix, and Xcode is not really helping you, you get this uh, underscore is, uh, which is not really the implementation we want. Uh, if we now run it, you see that the reloading table view is never executed. And this is because we have uh, an unknown self, so we manage memory correctly here, but it's released directly because we don't retain the subscription. And the funny thing is with memory management, if you create that retain cycle, and you run it again. Okay, I expected something else here. Um, either way, I, I was expecting this to uh, still execute the reloading table view, but apparently um, before it's even getting in here, it's not retaining the, the view controller. Best practice, make sure to handle the any cancelable, and make sure to handle memory events correctly with either unknown or weak self. All right, so let's get back to, to the code. Um, for the ones who weren't here before, we just implemented three steps. And we just finished the forum validation, and we're about to implement uh, a data task, um, which is based on URL session data task. So we go to step four. For the ones following along, um, there's a big list of requirements here. Um, I think it was uh, easy to move it a bit here as well, so you, you can actually start working and, and read what you need to do. But let's, uh, let's walk you through the code which we have in place um, before actually implementing. So we only want to start searching when there is more than two characters of input. Um, we're implementing a search field, and it's kind of bad if you start like doing the API request when you only have two characters, because it's likely that somebody is searching for something bigger. Um, so this is kind of a nice improvement to not hit the server all the time when the results 
aren't even used. Then we want to debounce for like a small amount of time. And this basically uh, holds back the subscription and waits till there is a, at least no, a 0 0.3 seconds, no input, and then starts doing the request. This is another optimization to not hit the server all the time for each input. Then we want to remove any duplicate inputs. As we do with debounce in the beginning, it could be that you are entering extra characters and remove them. And you end up after the, after the debounce with the same value as you triggered before. So you want to remove that duplicate to also not do an extra request in that case. When there's an error, um, right now we just show an empty list. But you can also use the error to show an empty view or show a response to the user like, hey, something went wrong. Um, if you're implementing this, use search response as the decoding. Um, because, yeah, it's tempting to use uh, the array of repo. Uh, I've seen that going wrong quite a few times. So I did some work for you. Um, we have a published property ready here, uh, directly uh, available to use. Um, and we can see that step one is uh, showing us that we need to implement the reload data. This also shows that the playground is shown before. It's very handy if you want to implement those steps, because we just uh, demonstrate how to implement this. So let's see if I remember correctly. First, we want to receive on the main queue to not get any crashes in terms of trading. And then we want to sync. We can ignore the value repos, because we are not assigning it here. And we want to reload data. And obviously, we want to do it in own self. All right, this is all good. Let's see if Xcode is still happy with us. And then we can continue. So what we, uh, what we have here is a simple method which transforms uh, the input query into a URL. Uh, this is what we need to pass through in the uh, URL session data task. And this is the big step two. So we need to set up a subscriber. We need to uh, implement all the characteristics of this, uh, this publisher as described before with the debounce and the removing duplicates. Then we want to map into a URL session task publisher. And we want to use the uh, method as seen before. Then we can decode to the search response, get the array of repo instances. Um, so if you look in search response, it's just a simple let with the items of uh, repositories. And the repo contains an ID, an owner, a name, and description. And finally, just show an empty list when an error occurs. So let's get started. We have a uh, published property of the search query, which basically uh, will pass through the string input of the form. And we're going to start with the first check, where we have to at least have two characters or more. More than two characters. All right, cool. So we're going to map, and we can do 0.count is larger than 2. Great. I want to skip the debounce and uh, remove duplicates for now. I think it's kind of nice to see what it does when you don't do that. So let's um, let's move on. We now basically have uh, a publisher of a string, and it only passes through the string if it's larger than two characters. But we want to have a URL because we need that later on in our data task publisher. So we're going to map again, and as the method uh, takes a string. We can basically directly uh, call that method. So like this. And it might sound look a bit strange, but it should work. Um, so the issue we get here, and it gets worse in a bit, is that the compiler is not really follow us along. Um, there are tricks to, to work around that. And 
Uh, I'm not so sure whether I'm able to do that now. Maybe I can just map to an empty array. Uh, In this case, yeah. yeah, because we use self. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think you might be right because we're. Yeah, but it's a, it's a method, you know. So if you use filter, it will not pass through, right? So. Um, yeah, I'm mapping to boolean. That's true, but. Um, we can use a filter here instead. That's the question, right? Um, and then, it, yeah, okay. I think in this case it could actually work, but um, yeah, it, it would not refresh the the list. So yeah, it, it depends on what you want to implement. If you would do a map, it would map to the boolean. Yeah, okay. We don't need a boolean. Okay, I get, I get the point now. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, in terms of the retain cycle, if there's one thing I'm really bad at, then it's weak and on itself. I, I can be honest with you. Um, so let's now just be a good citizen and use the unknown self uh, to be sure. And we get the query. And we want to return GitHub for query. And this is where you will see that it's needing itself. Uh, that's why it was mentioned. Uh, good feedback. Thanks for that. All right. So now we get an error which makes a bit more sense as well. Uh, we need an, uh, any cancelable type. And we can map query for just for now uh, to an array of repo. Return an empty array and assign to uh, repo on self. Let's see if Xcode is happy with this. Thank you. That's it. Indeed. Um, so this is something we didn't do before. What we have is uh, a published property here. And we only uh, subscribed to a published property. But right now, we're sending a value to the property. Uh, so basically, what we do, we have the search query. We map it to an empty array. And we assign it to the property repos. And then in the end, as we are subscribing on repos here, it will trigger this subscription and it will reload the data. So we can pass in a print here, run the code, and see what it does. So as you can see, we get an empty array all the time. So this is great uh, in the sense that we helped Xcode a bit and it, we gave it more context about what we, wanna, we, what we are expecting here. But we want to actually map it into uh, a request, and get back the response, and use that in the, uh, in the final result. So we're going to do a flat map here. We use the uh, URL for the request. Remove the type for now. Then we say URL session dot shared. And you'll find this throughout the foundation code where you can get a publisher for common tasks. So in this case, uh, a data task publisher, which will publish the uh, well-known like data and error and response of a, a URL request, um, a data request. So in this case, we have a URL. So we pass in the URL. And then we want to map transform. As you can see, uh, the value passed through the publisher is uh, on one hand, the data object, which we use to decode the JSON. And on the other hand, it's the uh, URL response, which we don't really need right now. So we can basically just map it to pass through the data. Then we want to use the data to decode it to our search response object. So we say decode search response.self. Um, I've had a property of decoder, which we can use. And here we come with another retain cycle otherwise. Um, so the decoder is defined right here. 
So now we have the search response, but as before, uh, we've seen that we, we want an array of repos, and in the search response we can see that it's items. So we do another map, and we want to have the items. As you can see, it's, it, it's getting quite hard to get sense of the code. I'm doing this without uh, auto completion. Um, it's because uh, Xcode doesn't have enough context to parse this uh, right now, and it's also because the return type is not the same as we need. So the uh, upstream expects an error of never, while we now have an URL error. It's pretty hard to read. Right, so at this point, it comes in handy if you have a bit of experience. So it's also good to build up your knowledge with Combine and play around with a bit of simpler uh, publishers. But basically, we can catch the error. For now, we ignore the error, and we want to return just an empty array. What this does is, um, in case of any error, so say the response uh, failed or the API backend is sending back a 404 in the case that there is no search results, um, at this point we are saying, like, okay, ignore the error, and just return an empty array, and I will use that in the search results list. Um, and this will also change the error type to never because we ignore the error, so there will be never an error. So right now, um, this is a bit tricky because we have the query here, but it's not actually a query anymore. Um, if you look, it's an array of repos already. So we need to remove the map because otherwise we would only get empty arrays again. And now we can run the code. So let's see if we get any results. So this is the moment where we need to start debugging, I think. Let's see what happens. Uh, just to be honest with you, I expected to have results now. So this is a real demo. Let's see what happens. Feel free to help me, by the way. <laughs> so, ah, okay. So, uh, <laughs> add a print statement and it works. <laughs> Live demos. All right, I guess um, it could be that we're using the GitHub uh, API. Uh, if you're about to use this uh, quite often, there's a limit on it as well, like 1,000 requests in an hour, I think. Let's see. Is it? Okay, is anyone getting this? Is it released, maybe? Let's see. Maybe print the error. Okay, yeah. Let's do it this way. <laughs> okay. All right. It's getting nicer and nicer. All right. So what you can do in the case of having uh, solutions, <laughs> look at the solutions. Um, do I have it still open? Yeah. So, step four. I'm still pretty proud. It's the first time I'm I'm cheating now, right? Did anyone else cheat so far? Okay, I'm not alone. <laughs> Makes me feel a bit better. <laughs> All right, so let's see what we did here. This is a bit more advanced as we uh, do the activity indicator as well. We do a flat map to a URL. We don't have a return type. We map the data. We decode. We map the items. We map the error. Maybe this is something you need, but I'm not. It shouldn't be the one. Uh. Yeah, I, I mean, that could be a. Uh, uh, oh, I need to edit it the right time. We didn't add the uh, debounce and stuff. So maybe uh, as we do too many requests. Okay. 
Yeah, let's, let's do that. That could actually be because we're doing too many requests at the same time. And maybe the print statement is delaying it just a bit more that it's actually <laughs> allowed to do it. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's do that. So the debounce is uh, very simple. You can basically just give the number and the scheduler on which you want to debounce. Um, in this case, we do the background queue. And let's also directly do the uh, duplicates, I said before. Let's first make it work and then remove it to see, uh, to show and demonstrate what it actually does. So let's see what this does. Hmm. I'm pretty sure it, uh, it worked with a print earlier before, right? So we want to catch the error. We can, uh, let's I want to actually know what's happening. Yeah, maybe it's this because I didn't edit this. But it's, it shouldn't be the thing. Live debugging. Maybe you learn something from this as well. How do I handle errors? Ah, okay. All right. I didn't prepare too much in the decodable, it seems. Um, items. Did I add something to the search response? I didn't, right? It's still items. Maybe it can't find. Um, Maybe it can't find a result for the things I'm typing, but. Yeah. Do I have an error from GitHub as well? You know, what actually could be, um, it happened before during the workshop. I'm not sure how many of you are on the Wi Fi and doing the same thing as me, but there could be a rate limit. Seriously, so um, if we all do the same request, GitHub is like, hey, this IP address is doing too many requests. Uh, you know, we can actually run the solution, right? That should work. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. <laughs> now it's getting fun. <laughs> all right, okay. I don't get a lot of info. Four G. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. A lot of live debugging. Let's do. Yeah. Uh, have, do the others have the same error happening? Because then, then it's definitely that. Okay. I'll Quickly enable my personal hotspot. We're not going to stop here, right? Just before the finish. All right. Now everybody can see my, my password. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see. So now I have to make sure that we are in the repo. Yeah. Okay. Let's move that back. We don't need to print. No, we don't need that. Let's. I completely trust 4G now. Boom. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks for the help there. Um, never use the GitHub API anymore in a workshop. Lesson learned. Either way, um, let's get back to the code. What we have is uh, we flat map the URL into a data request. We map it to the data object because we only need that for decoding into a search response. We get the items. We ignore the error. When there is any error, we return just an empty array. And finally, we assign it to repos, which will then trigger this whole subscription. And finally, reloads the data. So, before I hit the rate limit here, there is an, uh, a debounce. So let me show what happens if you wouldn't do that. Um, I think we have a print statement already. Uh, remove that. Yeah. So <laughs> it's printing out uh, the repos. Maybe we can make it uh, 
remove this print statement. Okay. Reload. Right. So what I want to show is what happens if you don't do the debounce, right? So um, first, we need at least two characters. But whenever I do input, you see that uh, we, we have a reload of seven times. Well, we were hitting the button quite fast. So you want to prevent that, because it's like not really needed to do that request. You're not really using the response. So you can debounce for, in this case, 0 0.3 seconds. It's uh, just a number, but it, it, it works. Um, so if we do now first two, or maybe I should actually use an, uh, a name. So it's debouncing, and it's only doing two requests now. Um, so this is a great optimization, and I think all your backend uh, friends will be very happy if you do this. But then we also have the remove duplicates. Um, let me move this a bit to the right so you can actually see the. So we have the debounce. And if I remove the R, place it back, remove, you know, it's still doing the reload. Well, in the end, it's still mocker. So we could actually reuse the uh, results we already had. And that's when you use the remove uh, duplicates, which basically checks whether the current value in the publisher is the same as the input we had before. So if we run this now again, so first we have mocker, boom, we have results. Remove, 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 and let it, and it's not doing a reload because we still have the same results. And this is also where combine shines, because if you want to implement this without combine, um, it's definitely not as easy as a one-liner, as you can see here. Um, this is the basic implementation for this workshop. Uh, I do have a few more things to implement, but because we only have 12 minutes left, more or less, and I also want to do a few questions, I'm going to quickly show you what I did for forum validation using the solutions for project. Um, once again, you can download this. I will show the link later on again uh, and go through it yourself when you're back at home. So what I added here, um, we basically say we want to reuse the validated username subscription, which we had before. Uh, it's a publisher with a Boolean value. And we want to assign validation color to a username text field. This is a custom method, so let's, uh, let's see what it is. We basically created an extension on any publisher where we say that the output type of the publisher needs to be a Boolean and the failure type needs to be never. If those conditions match, this method comes available. We pass in the text field. We want to use to uh, adjust the background color. We want to map the Boolean. If the Boolean is true, the color will be green, and otherwise it will be red. Um, I'm a great designer, so I thought like I not make it a full red color, but just a bit of a, an alpha component on it, and then assign it to the background property of the text field. So let's see what that does. If we go back to step three, you can see that the input currently is not valid. Um, so once we type, and we have more than three characters, it starts to be green. If it's a username which is already taken, it starts to be red again. And the same for the password, as we um, are also set the same for the password text field. And we use the uh, publisher which validates the input of the password. Um, we did the same for the password text field and the password confirm text field. So we can actually validate our, our code here. So we have a password. It's still red because the second password field is not matching. Now it's green. Then we uh, take a weak password. Maybe uh, let's let's do MobiCon this time. It's the same, but it's uh, a weak password. So maybe uh, 2018 works. And now it's green. Um, so this shows again the power of combine, where you can reuse your defined publishers and quite easily add form validation or trigger any other events whenever a Boolean changes in this case for validating the username or a password. The last thing 
Uh, I'm not going to demo it too much. Um, screen is a bit small, but this should work. What I did here is um, I have an activity indicator. Whenever the data task is triggered, I want to show the activity indicator, and I want to stop animating if either the subscription is completed or is canceled. That's about it in terms of the workshop. Uh, who finished as well? Who is with me? I see a hand there, I see another. Okay, that's quite a few. Okay, that's great. Cool. Um, for the others, try it out yourself when you're back at home. Uh, all the code is online. Um, there's a link for it right there. Uh, check it out. There's also valuable resources in terms of uh, blog posts um, as well as the playground. Uh, if you want to try out Combine, it's definitely a great resource uh, you can use. Thank you. Thank you as well for helping me when I was a bit in trouble. Um, I hope you learned a lot. I have no idea how this worked. Normally, I would sit with 20 people, and I would help and walk around, and now suddenly I was doing it like this. But I think it, uh, it worked great. Um, so yeah, thanks, and uh, let's do some questions. Maybe we can use the microphone again. Do you use combine in production? Do you use combine in production? Um, so I'm working at WeTransfer, and we have to adopt a few older uh, iOS versions. And we're also, well, my colleagues believe in the using the uh, original code of Apple. So that's why we never used frameworks like RX5 and stuff. Right now, I can start saying, like, hey, but this is an Apple framework. We should use it. Um, so right now, I'm not using it in production, but it could definitely be that there are apps live right now which are using it. Um, I don't have any examples of it. Oh, great. I have an assistant. Hi. Thanks Hi. for a great uh, workshop. Thanks. I wonder if you have any thoughts about Apple releasing combine just from iOS 13 mm -hmm. and not releasing it the same way Apple released Swift so it could be bundled with all their iOS versions. Yeah. There is a reason for them to do this. Uh, it probably has to do with runtime things. I mean, uh, th this is like a piece of knowledge I don't really have. Uh, but it, like there are a few things just like with Swift UI uh, which made them uh, decide to only release it for iOS 13 and up. Uh, if you ask me, I would honestly love to see it for iOS 12 as well, but they had reasons for the not to do that. Uh, I heard that there are some open source implementations mm -hmm. of Combine, so... Yeah, so maybe I can quickly find it. I think I know the URL um, to show you. There is like open Combine. This one. It is, I think, yeah. So open source implementation of Apple's combined framework. And the main goal of the project is to can be used in Apple's framework. Before, yeah, so this basically makes it possible to use combine in uh, iOS 12 as well. And if you look at the code, so you can see that they implemented all the kind of types. It's pretty crazy. Uh, if you want to do more with Combine, by the way, uh, this is also a great resource if you want to see like how to uh, do custom publishers and stuff, because they, they show you basically a whole implementation, how it's built up. Um, and it's pretty cool code as well, pretty advanced, I, I would say. Um, yeah, so the URL would be open Combine, Broadway lamp. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I can't see everything. If there's a question, yell. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm, uh, I'm here the rest of the day and tomorrow as well. Um, I'm really happy to talk with you. Uh, I'm really open to talk and answer any questions. Feel free to, uh, to do that. Also, I brought a few uh, Swiftly stickers. If you did a workshop and you finished it, I'm happy to give you one. If you didn't, I can still give you one. Uh, so I guess uh, that's it. We have eight minutes left. So. Perfect timing, I guess. Um, thanks, and uh, have a great mobile conf. <laughs>